Hello, hello. Welcome back, everyone, to the Michael Cisco Show. Big, big return guest today, Vincent James of the Red Elephants and an America First legend. So <laughs> I'd say, where where on the ranking would you put yourself of all the AF content creators, Vince? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'll leave that up to people who consume content to decide. But that's fair. Is, uh, fair I, I like your green screen. I really do like that green screen. I wish I had like a room like that in the house somewhere. That that yeah. that room before you like when you turned off your camera there and you can see the the room in its entirety. It was like I was just thinking about it. I'm just looking at. It, I'm like, man, that looks so cozy. That looks so. Co Imagine having a room like that with like a library surrounding you and like a fireplace and doing a live stream from literally inside of a room like that. Like that would be, that's, those are goals right there. Those are goals to have. It's true. Instead, I, I can't get the lighting right. And I get yeah, the glitch. I have I all see. the holes. The, I can see right my... through your forehead. I can see right <laughs> through your forehead to the other, to the live, to the books behind you. It used to be fine. And then I moved to West Virginia and I can't get the lighting right in my space. My it looks new, fine uh, as long as you are close to the as long as you're like right now it's okay so it's, it, it seems to be the case that as long as you're close to the camera that you're fine yeah. but if you start backing away then it, you can like then your then your forehead starts opening up Wait. there you go yeah see Wait. so it's kind of entertaining focus. yeah it's so. kind of entertaining though but uh yeah it's been an interesting couple of months i, I think i saw you what in december at the uh what was it the first the first uh, Stop the Steal rally. Yeah. I actually saw you at a few of those things that we went to. Yeah. The second or the second DC one I was at too. Oh, yeah. We actually right. ended up. Um, e I ran into you at Five Guys. <laughs> yeah. Five Guys. Right. 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 Yep. I'll never. Yeah, where we almost got uh, ran. Antifa went right by and I was I was ready to fight. <laughs> no, they did. Yeah, they did. But all they did was just they they just like flipped us off or something, and then just like walked right on by. So there was yeah, too many of us, too many of us deep for them to be able to do anything. That's true. And I was like, really, this is about to happen right now. While I'm in so. Five Guys, but yeah, nothing came of it. So, <laughs> but interesting times. But um, anyways. I think pretty much everyone knows who you are. Do we should we do a reintroduction of? I don't think so. I, I, mean, I mean, hopefully, people know who I am. I'm I'm uh, Vincent James. I I run a political podcast. I am the founder of the Red Elf RedElephants dot com. I do a show and uh, write articles, and we have a website, the RedElephants dot com, and been doing this for a few years now. And so that's basically that's who I am. But thanks for having me on, man. Appreciate it. Ah, thank you. Rate a musician who you actually also met at Five Guys. You couldn't miss him. I do, him. yeah. I remember him. <laughs> yeah, I remember him. I see his face pop up there. I remember him. <laughs> yeah, he says uh, you're you're his favorite of the America First crew. So, well, I appreciate it, man. How do you do that, by the way? You pop up the. Do you get to you click on? So with Streamyard, it has it like it it uh, links to YouTube. And then you can click on because I've seen this on other shows before too, like Viva Frey. He has the same sort. I think he probably streams with Streamyard too. And so you just click on a, a comment in the live chat, and it'll it'll highlight it. Or what's? Yeah, yeah. If I just click it on the right side, it just pops up right there. Oh, um, I see. So okay. I can't do it for my entropy chats. Obviously, there's no way to do that. But um, right. But that that reminds me for those watching already. Um, $50 is the entropy goal for the night, and the highest giver tonight gets to come on my solo stream for about 10 minutes oh, yeah. next week, which is going to be fun because a hit piece came out about me um, on really? the second. What did yeah, they say? from uh, just calling me, you know, the it's actually, you know, I'm Orthodox, and we have this, this um, contingent of SJW libtards in the church and they, they run a website called Orthodox and dialogue. And I like to call it sodomy in dialogue, but mm -hmm. um, pretty much there are these leftists that are trying to uh, liberalize the Orthodox church. And they, they wrote an article on me um, calling me a, well, the head, the headline says like, you know, it's just the usual crap, the white supremacists, 
monarchist, right. which I, you know, I am technically a monarchist, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I'm not, I'm also not a um, seditionist, so I can't apply my, you know, political theory to reality because we don't right. live in, you know, so it's, it's neither here nor there, but it's just the same, you know, it's, oh, well, you know, number one domestic threat to terror threat is white supremacy. It just might be the number one threat to the Orthodox church too, that type of stuff. So that's next week. I'll be responding to that. I, I didn't think it was important enough to set Vincent James aside for it. <laughs> so, uh, Next week, up it'll be a little fun solo episode. It's just like a content gift. Does that make you any do? Sense? Is it like a weekly show or? Um... Yeah, I'm on weekly week. or week. okay. Week, every bonus. Yep. Sometimes I do a bonus episode on Sundays. So that I've cut back a little, a little bit on that because you know I, I like to have a day off. But um, anyways, I did watch your ASU speech, and I thought it was quite, quite good, so I must say. Um, and you, you mentioned in that, that that Trump started a movement that will carry on even without him. Um, what is that movement, and what distinguishes it from, I guess, normal conservatism? Um, I would say, well, w what I meant to say by that was that, you know, if you look at what I said before that I was basically talking about the fact that, and we actually talked about this on the show today, the fact that they are afraid of the movement that he created and what Trump represents more than Trump himself. And the way that we know this is because we could look at what they're saying. Well, what are they saying? Well, you have the ABC news political director who came out on January 7th and said that getting rid of Trump is easy but getting rid of the movement and what he represents to so many Americans is something else. Now we have the CIA former counter terror chief come out just yesterday and say that we should be treating president Trump like Saddam Hussein or like Gaddafi in that we should be, um, we should be taking him out and cutting the head off the snake and then go after going after his movement, suggesting that, going to war against white right wing extremists is is the next step forward for us to be able to crush this dissident movement that we fear more than the leader himself and they do fear president trump obviously considering the fact that he's a kingmaker but in order to mitigate his movement or oh, arising once again and, and this movement that they fear more than Trump himself, they call for him to be convicted in the Senate, you know, call for him to be banned from holding political office ever in the future. Right. So what I said was that, yeah, there were, were a lot of failures, right? We talked about the failures on the show. I've talked about the failures of the Trump administration on my show often, but one of his successes was creating this movement that is it doesn't look like in any time in the near future is going to go away. And this movement that is powerful and a movement that is different from other right-wing movements in the past, completely different than the Tea Party, I would say more conservative than the Tea Party for the most part, something that's more powerful than a movement like the Tea Party. And I mean, you look at what he was able to do. What was he able to do? I mean, he was able to get people, he was able to get 300,000 people show up uh, on like a week's notice in Washington, D.C. I mean, this is why they fear him and they fear his movement so much. And so that's basically what I was referring to. I mean, he's me and you are talking today because of Trump. I have my show today because of Trump. Many connections that I've made, IRL or digital connections that I've made are because of President Trump. You know, these are the sorts of things that are going to last forever. These are the sorts of intangible successes of the Trump administration. It's a little, little off scripts, but do you, what do you, what do you see for Trump? Do you see him running again for 2024? And do you even want that to happen? I don't know. I mean, there has, there have been news stories that have come out that suggest that maybe president Trump will run again in 2024. There are other news suggestions or news stories that suggest that he might be trying to start a third political party, but then there are other news stories that say that he's sort of backtracked away from that and maybe won't do that at all. Um, we'll have to see what happens. I know this. I know that President Trump is a kingmaker 
And he, you know, whatever he does, whatever moves that he make, I know that there are a lot of people holding out and waiting to see what he's going to do next, you know, waiting to see what's going to happen next. I mean, since he's had his Twitter taken away, it's very difficult to find out, you know, where which route he's going down, you know, where he's going to be, what he's going to be doing next. But a lot of people are waiting to see. And if he does decide, I mean, I've said this on my show, if there's anyone that can create a viable third party, it would be President Trump, right? If there's anyone that could um, fast track the destruction of the Republican Party more than anyone else, it's President Trump. If there's anyone who's a kingmaker, it's President Trump. You know, it all depends on what he does. I don't know if he's going to run in 2024. I mean, how old is he going to be? He's going to be what, like 78, 78 years old. Now, certainly he's was somewhere around the same age as Joe Biden, and he's going to have a lot more energy than than a Joe Biden does at 78 years old. But I don't know if, if, if he's going to have that in him still or if he even wants to do that. We'll see what happens. I mean, I would certainly um, I would certainly support a 2024 run if he if he did so choose to do so. Yeah. Are you, uh, are you impressed with any of his children? <laughs> uh, no, not at all. I don't like his children at all. Well, well, if you had to choose between Ivanka and Marco Rubio in the Senate, which, which one would you, uh, go for there? Um, I'd rather have a, uh, a COVID Q-tip shoved up my asshole. <laughs> I'd, I'd rather I'd rather have be tested for COVID with a Q-tip being shoved up my asshole than either of them be uh, <laughs> be in anywhere near those positions. Is that is that really a COVID test now? I think it is. I think it is. That's insane, man. That's... At least maybe I don't know. Maybe it's a big joke. I, I wouldn't be shocked. Like the the fact that we don't know if it's real or not. I mean, that should tell you a lot. That's true. That's true. Uh, I know you also mentioned in your speech our nation being in a state of chaos. Um, what is fomenting that chaos, and what do you what do you think is the purpose or the end game of it? Do they have a plan? Is it is this a real? Or is this just? I'm trying to think of what you're referring to. So, uh, repeat that one more time. So there was a, there was a point in your speech where you mentioned that we were in a state of chaos. I don't I don't quite recall the. Um, the context of it, but I did have COVID when I was preparing these questions. <laughs> um, so I do know COVID's real. It's just not serious. I was sick for like five days, but um, but yeah, obviously we are we are in a bit of a chaotic state. With um, you know, I know yeah, I, think I think there was a report what I was about talking about purging uh, the military today. But yeah, yeah, we were going over that today in the show. I think what I was talking about is that you have a lot of these people who don't understand what conservatism is about. And we talked about Turning Point USA. We've talked about some of these other people, right? Dan Crenshaw. They a lot of what they do and a lot of what they say comes from a a misunderstanding of what conservatism is about. And we talked about how it's not about defending liberty. It's not about the free market. It's not about GDP. It's not about any of these things. It's first and foremost about order. And we talked about returning to the regulation of morality in the country. We talked about being truly conservative socially and culturally, certainly politically. And so you have a lot of these different candidates, a lot of these different politicians and office holders who say and do things thinking that and you know a lot of these groups like turning point usa and so forth um where their rhetoric shows us and their actions show us that they, they this is all coming from a failed understanding a misunderstanding of what being conservative is of what conservatism is about and so i think i went on to say that you know we need someone, we need something that is truly going to be in opposition to leftism, truly going to be in opposition to the system, rather than concede and bow and cave to the system time and time again. We just saw this with Marjorie Taylor Greene. We've seen this with Steve King. And I talked about that, the fact that, you know, you have a party which has just been basically kicking the can down the road, moving further and further left socially, culturally, politically, and so forth, just begging the people above them on the power structure to 
go easy on them, right? Begging the media to go easy on them, begging the Democratic Party to go easy on, on them. Whereas when you look at like what the Democratic Party does, they stick together, right? They stick together because they know that's going to give them a better chance of winning. And so that's basically what I was talking about there. Nice. Yeah, I think I think what I actually initially intended, because you because you, you mentioned it a little bit, it kind of got my brain going back. I think what I was getting at was you mentioned order as the, being the key difference between kind of the uh, the core value of the right versus the left, and we don't really have a true a true right wing in American politics, which I think is what we're trying to establish, right? Um, so I guess. If we could expound on that, what what principles do we need to kind of let go of? I think we actually did a, a ghost interview once that never got published because I had some tech issues a while back, and and you you hit on this a little bit with um, getting into um, enlightenment principles, kind of talking about what it meant to be a paleocon. Um, so could you could you touch on maybe? what we need to set aside from our current mythos, I guess, American mythos that might not, uh, might be in conflict with an actual true principled, well, not principled conservatism, but a, but a principled right-wing movement that could actually compete against the left. Well, I mean, well, for instance, I mean, just basically like you look at the idea of America first, right. And you look at being America first on certain policies, certain, uh, uh, political issues like immigration, like foreign wars, like free trade, like things like this. Like these are things that we have talked about where we really are different from a lot of the more mainstream conservatives nowadays or a lot of the more mainstream, especially elected Republicans nowadays. Nowadays, you see Republicans talking about and we're not just talking about elected republicans I and mean, we're talking about even prominent conservative talk show hosts where they believe that it doesn't matter that the demographics in america are changing it doesn't matter if by 2050 or by 2060 white americans become a minority in the country it doesn't matter if you completely exchange the population for one population to another, that America is still going to be the same, that America is still going to be the same country when this is not true. Like we can take, if, if you take, for instance, the entirety of the population of Nicaragua right now, and you, let's say that they completely understand uh, the constitution of the United States. They completely understand American values. They completely understand exactly how America operates. They completely understand American culture. Let's say that we give them all of that and we take them and we take the current American population out of the equation and we put them in America. Will the country still be the same? The country is not going to be the same. The country is going to be entirely and completely different. And then outside of that, you have the political sustainability of the demographic change that's occurring right now in the country. And this is something that we uh, have talked about before a lot on my show and, and something that were the rhetoric, my rhetoric about the demographic change and the political consequences of the demographic change completely differs from a lot of the rhetoric coming from elected Republicans and more mainstream conservative pundits, whereas that they believe that, that, you know, Republicans are still going to be the, the viability or the possibility of Republicans holding office is still going to happen, even if that demographic change occurs, because we are going to be able to convince these people that conservative values are the way forward, because these people are, as they say, natural conservatives. But time and time again, as we've looked at elections and as we as as we've looked at history of the country, especially in the past 50 or 60 years, this has not been proven to be true. And so it's things like this, right? It's things like this. Uh, and maybe we go even outside of that and we look at, for instance, uh, social conservatism, right? I think that it's becoming increasingly unpopular to be against homosexual marriage, but it's because we have let it become, it's because we have let it, we have let it uh, get to this point where we have seen this, and we, we talk about this a lot, which is that the uh which is the 
the um I'm trying to think of the the word that we use the the how how things have sort of degenerated to a point to where it's becoming increasingly acceptable to you know the current state of the country the current moral degeneration of the country and where 10 years ago where Barack Obama was talking about the slippery slope right where Barack Obama was saying openly and publicly that he opposed gay marriage whereas now this is something that not even that you know too many people wouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole and so it's things like the social conservatism drag story hour some of these things like these are things that are issues that republicans could win on if they weren't to if they weren't so fearful of making some of these things wedge issues and then like so like social media censorship it's been we have been talking about social media censorship for the longest time in that it's a very important issue and maybe even the most important issue for the Republican Party, but Republicans didn't take this seriously enough, and they haven't taken this seriously enough. And for years, they thought that it was never going to happen to them. It wasn't going to get that bad. That you would only get kicked off of social media platforms if you, you know, if you were like a Nazi or something like this. Well, now I think it's becoming very clear to them that this is a big issue and should be one of the top priorities for the Republican Party. And we see like where Ron DeSantis is going right now. And so like these are we have to, you know, Madison Cawthorn talks about how we need to have a new right, a new Republican Party. But of course, you know, <laughs> basically it's just the old Republican Party repackaged. In with you know with like in a wheelchair, yeah, like putting re lipstick on a pig, right? Like completely disguising the fundamental. It's they're just basically just trying to rebrand and disguise their fundamental failings of a party. And you know what we really need to do is focus on some of these things that we talk about and that I've talked about on my show. And so I guess I don't know if that completely explains what I mean, or if or if you or if I'm articulating this properly, but. But that's basically um, what I meant when I said that. So you mean to speech. tell me that uh, that Joe Biden's refugees are not going to uh, not going to vote for us for for Republicans? Yeah, and unfortunately, no. Unfortunately, no. Unfortunately, yeah. I mean, yeah, we are surely seeing an increase in Hispanic support for President. We saw an, a slight increase in Hispanic support for President Trump, but nationally, I mean, we're not going to see it be over fifty percent, and especially especially if these people aren't given a chance to assimilate into society, which they're not given a chance. I mean, we're just constantly you know, a constant flood at our border, a constant surge at our border for the past 50 years. And these enclaves are formed where they don't ha really have to assimilate any longer, especially because they all speak the same language. They don't even have to learn English in a lot of, and there's no real incentive for them to learn English. And so, and, you know, you have the whole thing with welfare and how the majority of them are on welfare for 20 plus years. And so it's, it's, it doesn't appear likely that we are going to get an over 50%, um, uh, yeah, over 50% of them, uh, voting for someone like a president Trump or even siding for things that conservatives care about like gun rights and, and free speech rights and so forth. And so, you know, it's, it's a big problem, but of course, you know, we don't have people in office talking about these things because they're too afraid to talk about these things. And it's, you know, um, you know, and then, and then if they do sort of hint at these sorts of issues, or if they, if they do hint at these issues, then what happens? Then they get, you know, then they get other Republicans who take them off of committees or censure them or formally disavow them or something like that. And then they, you know, cause they have that whole thread of the democratic party saying, well, this person's racist or anti-immigrant or white nationalist or whatever. And, you know, you have that whole thread of that happening. So. Yeah. Yeah. Are they, I mean, it's cause it's weird, man. The, the GOP seems to, cause I, I get a sense. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I got to actually be a part of an experiment where I, I managed a candidate that ran on, you know, the 10 year immigration moratorium, a uh, very socially conservative platform. Uh, we were, we were literally paying, trying to pay people to get married and have kids in no fault divorce, you know, very, of course we were in Delaware. So we, we took it a little easy on the, uh, you know, the gay marriage stuff. We didn't, we didn't really, uh, 
include that in the platform. We, we tried to avoid the subject, but we, you know, because we're trying to organize votes and right. we had Rehob Rehoboth Beach to deal with. But it, it, I, I did get the sense that there was an actual, even among the boomers that we like to make fun of so much, there was a, a hunger and a desire for, for like real conservatism. And those, it was like, oh my goodness, here's a real conservative candidate. And, you know, she got the most votes in Delaware history for, <laughs> for a Republican. Still lost because of, you know, it's Delaware. Right. But, and of course, the party hated us and they did everything they can to, to you know, of course, once we won the, once there was, they, they could see the momentum. So there was only so much they could do, but they, they weren't any help and they impeded every way they could. Um, you know, people are talking about the green screen eating my face. Yeah, well, <laughs> it is. Yeah, we were it talking is. about that earlier. You can see right through, yeah, see right yeah. through your forehead, right through your nose. But you know, <laughs> it, is, it is what it is. I think I'm. A, I, need, I need better lighting. I think it's this thing. But um, yeah, if, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, um, so I, I there's an obvious just the eyeball test. There's an obvious desire for real conservatism among the populace, but the GOP. It's just they either seem purposefully out of touch, like they're colluding with the left, or they're just out of touch with reality, with what the people want. And and whether it's on purpose or not, they're effectively being gatekeepers for the, the actual left, keeping real conservatives out of any position of to, to even really contest. Do you think that's purposeful? Is it or is it just are they just retarded? <laughs> I think it's uh, probably both. Um, I think that, you know, you have the system which has like this automatic natural response to um, oust outsiders or dissidents or insurgent movements. And there's a lot of ways that they do that. Of course, they have, you know, certain groups that provide them with the funding for their campaign finance that you know, call the shots. I mean, we see what, what's happening with like Marjorie Taylor Greene right now. And we, we saw what happened with Steve King. And we see how the Republican Party treats people who are truly a threat to the establishment and the established order. And so a lot of it's on purpose. A lot of it maybe would is the case that, you know, that a lot of these guys, I mean, it's, they're just geriatric and right there. They are completely out of touch with reality and out of touch with what conservatives in America want. And, um, I, I think, though, that it might be getting to the point where some of them see that, the, the, you know, they obviously just they, they can't do anything about this. They see the rise of the Trump movement. They don't like it. If they if it was up to them, they would convict him in the Senate. They would prevent him from being able to hold public office ever again. But they see how unpopular that move would be. And so there's really there's there's sort of like in a catch 22 where there's really nothing that they can do about it. But you're right. I mean, there is a hunger. There is a desire for a true right wing, for a true conservative movement. And especially now where we have a lot of these people, millions of Trump supporters who feel completely disenfranchised and alone and feel like there is no political representation for them in Washington, D.C., and that really does present us with an opportunity. Like it really does present America first with an opportunity to be able to corral those people and harness that energy and harness that desire and, and push these people in the right direction. And this is something else I've talked about, which is that, you know, the Republican Party sees that this is the case. They see that there is this void there and that they're pretty much finished or on their way out. And so they're not going to let that that space be unfilled, right? They're going to try to do something to where, you know, they rebrand or we have like the Patriot Caucus or the Freedom Caucus steps up or, you know, you have Trump, Repub you know, they're going to try to do something to rebrand. They're going to try to push certain candidates. And I don't think, I don't think that this time people are going to fall for it. I honestly don't. I think maybe there might be some, but not as many as there would be if this was like five years ago or if some of the stuff that happened after the Capitol six riots, it was Capitol six, uh, sorry, January six Capitol siege. If some of those things didn't happen, maybe that, that wouldn't be the case. But I think that things just sort of fell in line to where 
we do have this unprecedented historic opportunity to be able to harness that desire as we talked about. And uh, it's just a matter of how we move forward from here. So, yeah, uh, we do have a super chat question from Ray to musician. Are there any viable and or up and coming people running for office that are even close to our sense of conservatism? Yeah, so hopefully within the next couple of months or so, we're going to have a something up on uh, the website where we're going to have a list of people and we're going to have what they're on the issues are, right? And only the people who align with America First, who align with us on the issues are going to be listed on this on this website. I have been reached out to by I have been reached out to by a couple of people who are planning on running for office in a smaller sense. So we're going to be talking about that in the months to come. But um, it's and and honestly, there are a few that are already in office that I like. I mean, Paul Gosar and some of these people are even older, but they get it. You know, Paul Gosar, Louis Gohmert, um, even Andy Biggs, Marjorie Taylor, like some of these people understand and they're already in office, but it, it seems like there are, I've been reached out to by so many different people. It seems like a lot of people are ready to step up and are ready to, to start running for, for certain positions, even if it's in like a smaller sense, right? Even if it's like a school board or district attorney or the sheriff or something like this, like these are the sorts of people that are bring, being reached out to by, right now. But soon, hopefully within the coming months, we're going to have a list of people that are America first candidates, right? America first approved candidates. So we'll see what happens with that. I'll, uh, I'll announce my candidacy. I'm just going to go big for something totally unrealistic, you know, failing up how they say. So. <laughs> yeah. And so that's the thing. Like you have a lot of these people who run for office and they run for office in, 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 in parts of the country or parts of the city that they live in parts of the County that they live in that aren't politically viable in any way, shape or form, aren't demographically viable at all. Like, uh, like the, the, there's too many, there's a hundred thousand more Democrats in the district. Like, I'm, we're not going to promote people like that, right? We're going to promote people that actually have a chance of winning. And and so, you know, there, there's, there's a certain filter, uh, obviously, that we have to go through with these people. But, um, but yeah, but so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Michael Cisco running for, <laughs> running for president. I mean, <laughs> running for the president. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, what's this? I know Ray asked another question, something about Bank of America giving data to the FBI. Do you know anything about that? Uh, I saw something, some news report, and I didn't really look too much into it, but I saw, because I didn't have time to, I was doing the show today, but I saw some news report about Bank of America basically giving the FBI information of, they're basically giving their customers information out of anyone who was like, used their credit card, who was a Bank of America customer on January 6th around the Capitol building or in Washington, D.C., period. So... That's what I heard. I don't know how true that is. I didn't watch the Tucker uh, segment, but that's what I s saw in, you know, the, the the article that I saw on social media this morning that I didn't uh, read through entirely. But that's the gist of it, I guess. Yeah, well, I just switched to a local bank, so I, I think everyone should do that. Honestly, that's the uh, that's the play right. local localism in general like these uh i know you're kind of talking about people running for local office but honestly that's kind of um i think a strategy that could work for uh, affecting our lives the most honestly our lives and and being a bit of a pushback against the the establishment machine is local infrastructure right. so uh, but what do you what do you what do we so what do we do with the gop is a third party a viable option for us other i mean obviously i know you mentioned trump might be the only the answer to that but what do you think in general i don't think i don't think a third party is a viable option considering what we've seen throughout history with third parties unless trump is the one who starts the third party then maybe you know then i guess even but that but even that is questionable honestly like the sustainability long term of a of a third party started by president trump so 
uh, and I've talked about this on my show many times. I, I just don't think that a third party is the way forward. Um, maybe many, many years from now, but in my opinion, I think that the right now, right now from within is probably the best option. So how do we go about the from within? Uh, is it just the promoting? Is it just promoting the candidates that we, how do we, how do we go about getting, I don't know, man. It's just, I guess, what is, what is the ultimate play to destroy the GOP? <laughs> Well, I mean, the deal, the, the GOP itself is basically on its way out. And that's what we talked about when we talked about how they're going to try to basically attempt to rebrand. Like if there's anything that the capital six or the January, I keep saying capital six, the January six capital siege did, it was fast track, the destruction, the inevitable destruction of the GOP. Um, so, you know, like we were seeing Ted Cruz come out and basically expose himself. And, you know, you have these comments being exposed that he made about how, Donald Trump is a reckless liar. He's irresponsible. We see what Mitch McConnell is doing and Mitch McConnell basically is completely destroying his political career, just burning it all up. Maybe he's, you know, heading into retirement, so he doesn't care. Uh, we have, you know, what Lindsey Graham has said, where he's basically calling for Trump supporters to be put in the, in the electric chair for what they did on January 6th. Um, so, you know, it's it's like the, like I said, if there's anything that the January 6th capital siege did and accomplish, it was fast tracking the inevitable destruction of the GOP. And it's where they go from here. That's that's, you know, it's, it depends on where they go from here. What are they going to do? What are they going to do? Like, what is the next step? Is the next step to rebrand or attempt to rebrand or maybe co-op the America first name or the Patriot Caucus or the Freedom Caucus or something like this? Like. Uh, if Trump does start a third party, the Patriot Party or something like this, are they going to try to, you know, hide themselves in that or disguise themselves with that? Um, the as far as running America first candidates, that seems to be the only short term option, the only short term solution, but it's not. I mean, I wouldn't say that it's the long term, it's the only long term solution either. So really, um, r really, when you talk about like, wh how do we destroy the GOP? I think the GOP is helping us out with that themselves, honestly, from what we're seeing come from them. Um, it's just once again, it's just we've been presented with this opportunity where you have 74 million Americans who are feeling disenfranchised. They feel like they have no political representation in Washington, D.C. And so it's just a matter of us getting out front and center, you know, you have AFPAC coming up, you know, getting out front and center and trying to get, grab that attention, trying to harness that, that, that desire that you talked about for a true American right, for a true reactionary right. Right. So that, that's part of it too, is getting out front and center, making yourself heard, making sure you're out there first and, and warning people about what they're going to attempt to do so that people recognize it when they do when they do that still amazing how many people fall for it right but uh Luthi and the mortal says uh wants you to read nihilism the root of the revolution by uh, orthodox saint father seraphim rose the kingdom of man is nothing compared to the kingdom of god this fight is spiritual pray for me so good. interesting yeah I'll, I'll keep it i'll keep that in mind it's actually an interesting book, whether you're Orthodox or not, because it gets into the nihilistic mindset of the revolutionary left, basically. So it's pretty... oh, so you've read the book then? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. it's on my on my public reading list that I actually have out there for for people. Um, final question, just to kind of, as I know, I know we got to wrap up soon. Um, a lot of I know a lot of figures in the AF movement, um, like Nick Fuentes, are, are encouraging caution um, with the, especially with the way that the, the left is acting right now, go purging the military, shutting, debanking people, arresting people who went, who were at the Capitol siege thing. Um, how do, so how do we kind of urge people to be cautious without completely detaching and still being productive for the movement? Well, um, well, there's a, there's a, there's, a, I mean, I've been talking about this on my show for a while, which is that I've encouraged people to, especially after, January 6th, especially after what happened, I've been encouraging people to um, I've been encouraging people to do what I am trying to do. Right. That that's all I can do. I'm not going to encourage people to do something that I'm never going to do. One of those things is move away from cities. Right. Get out of the cities. 
start getting to maybe a place, maybe even if it, if like, even if it's like a suburb, but at least it's sort of far away from the city. Like I'm planning on moving away from California. I'm planning on moving to like North Idaho. This is what I have in store for myself in the near future. Um, stock up on food, stock up on water. You should always do that, right? Stock up on energy, stock up on things that you can use as self-defense. Um, basically get together and regroup, get together with neighbors, get together with friends, purchase land, uh, accumulate resources. Um, as far as the caution is concerned. Yeah. I mean, I've talked about this on my show forever. Like don't join militias. I've talked about Schaefer Cox. I don't know how many of your viewers know about Sha the Schaefer Cox story, but I've talked about Schaefer Cox on my show. I've talked about the Oath Keepers. I've talked about some of these groups that are certainly going to be infiltrated by federal agents. Um, uh, you know, and you know, these are things that you can do to protect yourself, to protect the movement, but also be useful to the movement in the future. If you have people like we were talking about the military on my show today and the route the military is going where they're, you know, purging people, they're going on a stand down to make sure they can detect like if they have Trump supporters in their ranks or something. Um, if you go into these different institutions and, and you get positions of power in these different institutions and you keep your mouth shut and you don't post bullshit or stupid shit on your social media feeds or you don't even have social media at all and you just keep your eyes on the prize, right? And you go forward and you get into these positions of power in these different institutions. These are, this is influence that we're going to be able to use in the future. This is power that we're going to be able to use in the future. Um, we were talking about how, like, what's the, what's the solution to the military where we're seeing, you know, women in combat roles, trans, uh, pl platoon leaders, you know, like trans, uh, people yelling in your face telling you what to do like this this the way that the military is going and i we say i asked what the solution is and basically what the solution is is it's the same if you're going to join the military keep your head down keep your mouth shut about your political beliefs rise up in the ranks and these are positions of power in in the institution of the armed forces that we can use in the future and the same goes for the private sector as well right or like we look at academia, like th there are so many different positions of power in the American institutional system that we could use in the future if we were to put our people in place in those positions of power. And so when we talk about caution, we not only are we talking about caution in terms of being careful, don't show, don't join militias, don't join certain groups, um, you know, don't join certain formal groups like the oath keepers or the three percenters or or something like this don't post on social media don't 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 fed post on social media but we're also talking about caution in terms of you know in your daily lives at your job and in, in your in your professional place of business uh in places in the private sector or the public sector positions in the private sector or the public sector that we can use in the future like that's a way to help the movement as well and so i don't know if that answers your question but you know these are things that i've been talking about on my show for quite some time nice yeah i fled i fled to west virginia i'm up here in the mountains so but let's close with one final like, don't question. do what i did like don't do what i did and completely destroy any potential for you to be uh <laughs> <laughs> like like, like a, a, a useful or viable to yeah like i for instance i know right now people close to me who are uh i know a few people that are in academia who are going to be useful in the future in that they are going to publish studies that are going to we're going to use for policy proposals in the future like these are the sorts of things that we talk about right nice uh luthien says to invite you on a prayer stream great lent is upcoming i did do a uh for new year's i did a, a all night psalter reading but uh <laughs> uh let's let's close with this i know you got a, i know you got to, to bounce soon uh who would win in a fight jake lloyd or Jaden mcneil that's a good question um I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. They're basically the same height. Oh, well, Jaden's a little bit taller. I would say that Jaden has probably a bigger reach. I think, but I think Jake's Jake a little. Lloyd is, he's, he's like, he's like, he's, he's, he was in the army, right? He was in. 
the armed forces. So he probably, I don't know, maybe he has some hand to hand combat training. Who knows what he knows, right? So maybe he's like, maybe he's like a secret black belt or something. You never know. So I don't know. It's a good question. I'm just going to leave, I'll leave that up to the, I'll leave that up to the viewers to decide. <laughs> any, any closing thoughts before you go? No, that's it. Thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for watching. And uh, next week, you can come see me respond to Sodomy and Dialogues, little hit piece on me. So see you guys next Thursday. Take it easy.